When it comes to changing the tone of sounds within your mixes, the tool you're most likely to reach for is EQ. EQ allows you to modify the harmonic content of a sound by turning up or down the volume of individual frequency groups. If you want a sound to be brighter, you can boost the volume of harmonics at the top end. If you want to scoop weight out of boomy, low-end sounds, then you can use EQ to drop the level of those frequencies. EQ allows you to make general, broad changes to harmonics present in a sound, or very specific surgical changes, which only tackle narrow problem areas. But the crucial thing about EQ is that it only allows you to cut or boost the volume of frequencies already present in a sound. If you decide to add a 5 kHz boost to a sine wave baseline, absolutely nothing is going to change, because you're attempting to add volume to frequencies which don't exist in that core sound. It's just not going to work. So if what you want to do is to boost the number of active frequencies present in a sound, in other words, to sort of add to its harmonic footprint, you can use distortion and saturation tools. To understand what distortion is, let's turn the concept of distortion into a picture. Think of sound with a frequency analyzer switched on. What you get to see is a picture of the harmonics within that sound. If you add a filter or a processor to a digital picture, its picture changes with its colors saturating or inverting or turning upside down or twisting in some other way. We can do the same thing with distortion tools when processing audio, changing the picture of the waveform by modifying the active harmonics and therefore changing their sound. Distortion comes in various forms, and whilst these different approaches are available digitally as plugins within our computers these days, like most audio processes, distortion used to only exist in the analog realm, and of course, could be achieved by various means. Distortion often brings to mind electric guitarists shredding away through Marshall amps. Whilst the musical uses of distortion extend far beyond guitar players and such extreme examples, amplifier distortion is actually a useful place for us to start our journey as we begin to understand this effect and its capabilities. Because distortion is actually a kind of catch-all term to describe the process of altering the sonic picture of a sound, and within that term, a number of different treatments exist, all of which change sounds in subtle or more extreme ways. Overdrive, for example, gets its name from boosting the input level into a vacuum tube. And as many guitar amps feature tubes, overdrive became and remains a really popular effect. As some early amps only featured one volume control, the only way to overdrive them was to turn volume up to maximum, which created its own problems, particularly when bands played live and it came to balancing the volume of an overdriven amp with other band members on stage. Also not popular if you live next door to somebody who doesn't like the volume of your amplifier. So one crucial thing to look out for with tube-based amps is that they now tend to feature two controls for volume, the input gain stage and the output volume stage. The first of these controls the amount of signal level coming into an amp to drive tubes into distortion, whereas the volume dial at the end then controls the output level, meaning that you can have that distortion but at the volume that you want it. Many distortion plugins feature input and output volume controls which copy these amp options. The other amp type available to guitarists are solid state models, which use transistors to amplify a signal rather than vacuum tubes. Usually, these offer a cleaner sound which can't be overdriven in the same way that tubes can, so they're less favoured by guitarists who want to use their amps for more shredding, distortion uh, kind of effects. Remember though that stomp boxes allow guitarists to introduce distortion outside of their amps, with harmonic shaping available at the click of a button. Using dedicated hardware distortion effects like this takes the pressure off the amp being solely responsible for how distorted a signal can become. But it's not only guitarists who understand the power and musical usefulness of distortion. A distortion unit like Thermionics Culture Vulture was built as a studio distortion unit rather than one specifically for guitarists. It allows us to explore distortion in a number of ways which get beyond guitar processing and bring distortion options to a much broader range of audio sources. It offers three different distortion types. Remember, this is the crucial part. Distortion changes the picture of an audio signal by adding harmonics. So in the Culture Vulture, triode mode adds even harmonics, even numbered harmonics, producing gentler, warmer results. 
Pentode 1 increases the amount of odd numbered harmonics, with the capability to produce wilder, thicker, and more brazen distortion treatments, much more tube like. And Pentode 2 offers a more extreme version of that kind of odd numbered harmonic saturation. If you're familiar with subtractive synthesis, there's a parallel with the way that we can think about waveforms and harmonics. A single waveform synth sound becomes richer and more complex if a second oscillator is added with a different waveform. Remember, those wave shapes equate to harmonic content, and as we're learning, the more harmonics that are present, the richer and thicker the sound's going to be. But let's get back to distortion. The culture vulture, like many valve-based processors, actually features a valve at the input stage and another at the output stage. The bias control varies the amount of electrical current passing through the cathode of the distortion, or output if you like, the valve at that point, with high bias amounts restricting the amount of current to produce cleaner, less distorted results. Lower bias settings overload the output valve more by increasing current levels, introducing more harmonics and therefore distortion. Drive controls the amount of levels sent from the input valve to the output. As you can imagine, varying the drive and bias controls significantly changes the relationship between the two valves and therefore the distortion treatments which can be created in the culture vulture. And this helps to explain why there are so many different flavors to distortion. If the input level signal, gain relationship between the two valves, variable amounts of electrical charge passing through the unit and mode to determine whether odd or even harmonics are added are all variable, the sonic result is bound to change even with tiny adjustments to any of these parameters. In pre-digital days, the preferred recording medium was tape. Recording engineers realized that tape offered a sweet spot where recording levels could just begin to break up as they hit tape at a certain volume, producing a color which felt warm and rich. If you push the input level to tape too hard, it will distort dramatically. But unlike digital distortion, where the threshold between no distortion and distortion is a boundary line, tape levels offer a dynamic level between these two positions, where softer clipping and tape saturation can produce these musically pleasing results. It's no surprise that tape emulation saturation plugins are so popular in our digital audio workstations today. And even digital recording is subject to distortion. Modern workstations and audio interfaces are now capable of recording at such high sample rates and bit depths that distortion added as a result of audibly substandard components are broadly a thing of the past. We just don't have to worry about those things anymore. But the early days of sampling and digital recording were less transparent, with the 8-bit SID chip in the Commodore 64, a classic, and the 12-bit Roland S-series samplers, just two examples of digital recording devices whose resolutions changed the picture of the sounds they recorded and therefore added their own characterful distortion. Bit crushers do exactly this in our computers now. They reduce sample resolution, which you can think of as the clarity or quality of the digital sound being recorded. They add aliasing, ringing overtones, and a series of other sonic artifacts. It's crucial to know that adding distortion to your productions doesn't have to mean decimating them with all-encompassing, howling, gritty effects. Adding a tape emulation plugin to the output of your mix, for example, will add gentle saturation, finessing the harmonic content of your mix subtly, and it will smooth out transients in your tracks too. All of this qualifies as distortion, but the sounds, but it sounds very different to the way that we hear overdrive effects within rock guitar solos. So clearly there's a huge axis across which distortion effects can exist, with some crucial parameters for us to manipulate our mixes in subtle or dramatic ways.